So if there's one thing we know about Florida and the election, it's that Florida is going to be very, very close. We've got some polls out today that show how much that's always the case and continues to be the case. Um, CNBC had a new poll out, shows Joe Biden up by three points over Donald Trump, Trump among likely voters in Florida. Then there's an ABC News Washington poll that shows Trump ahead by four. Remember, in 2016, Donald Trump won the state by just over 100,000 votes, or a bit over 1%. And the 538 polling average, to give you a sense, for Florida has Joe Biden just up by 1.6. So, again, razor thin. Now, Republicans know how close the state can be, and they have undertaken this staggering assault on people's access to the franchise precisely for that reason. On our show, uh, we've covered this incredible grassroots effort to restore voting rights to some of the felons in Florida who had the paid their debt to society. Florida used to have this among the strictest felony disenfranchisement laws in the country. But two men, a Republican and a Democrat, white and black, both convicted of felonies, organized a Florida constitutional referendum, and people voted. And in that sharply divided state, look what the results were in 2018. This is a 50-50 state, right? Look at those results. 65% voted yes, 35% voted no, in favor of democracy and reintegration of the formerly incarcerated. An incredible victory. Well, the Republicans got to work on that, and the Republican legislator moved to pass a law that would stop former felons from voting until they paid their fines, even though that's nowhere in the text of what people voted for back in 2018, but it would disenfranchise those same people all over again. The Republicans in the legislature passed it, and the Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, signed it, and now, perhaps, as 775,000 people cannot vote unless they come up with money. That's right, they have to pay money to vote. If that sounds like a poll tax, a federal judge agreed, writing, quote, the 24th Amendment precludes Florida from conditioning voting in federal elections on payment of these fees and costs. Now, with the voter registration deadline looming on October 5th, less than two uh, weeks away, the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, this grassroots group's working on this, has raised more than $20 million with a recent contribution from Michael Bloomberg to pay those fines in time to make sure every eligible voter in the state can cast a ballot this November. Joining me now are two people instrumental in this project, Desmond Mead, president of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, who had his right to vote restored by Amendment 4 in 2018, and author of the forthcoming book, Let My People Vote, My Battle to Restore the Civil Rights of Returning Citizens, and John Legend, a major fundraiser for the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, who's also written and produced a few hit songs that you might have heard of. Um, <laughs> let me start with, with, with you, Desmond, about where things stand right now. There's a, this has been a, a, such a struggle, and so many two steps forward, one step back, and federal lawsuits. How would you characterize where things stand right now in terms of formerly incarcerated folks in your state having access to the ballot? Well, Chris, first of all, thank you for having me on again. It's great to see you. Uh, but let me, let me start by saying this, you know, and I know you mentioned something about Bloomberg, but this thing is far beyond that. You know, I think that we're, I'm happy, I'm smiling, because I'm seeing something amazing. Over 44,000 people across the country have been standing up to free to vote in Florida that believes that a person should not have to choose between putting food on their kid's plate or voting. They shouldn't have to choose between paying their rent or mortgage on voting. And so this is, is, is an amazing uh, a display of, of people just standing up to defend uh, creating a more inclusive democracy. So where do we stand? I'm going to tell you where we stand, that we have 1.4 million Floridians uh, who benefited from Amendment 4. And out of those 1.4 million, there's 774,000 who have some type of outstanding financial obligations. Let's not lose sight of the fact that that still leaves five to 600,000 returning citizens who can register to vote right now today because they don't have those barriers. But right. we're not forgetting about American citizens, one of which who just died last week and her dying wish was to be able to cast a ballot before she did pass away. But unfortunately, she was unable to do so. And I know that there's so many American citizens in that 700 and 74,000 that want to experience what I experienced just a few weeks ago when I voted for the first time in over 30 years. And what that experience was goes beyond partisan politics. 
We letting those legislators legislate and the, and the litigators litigate, and we're going to let the politicians do what they do to try to divide this country. But at the core of what we're doing is bringing people together from all walks of life, all political persuasions, to experience the American dream of being able to stand up in the voting booth and say that I am, I exist, and I count. You know, uh, John, what Devin is speaking to there about the sort of uh, the sort of indefatigability about of, of, the, of this effort and this movement. I mean, you know, you you, you organize, you get this 75 percent, 65, 35 outcome in a divided state's amazing. Then the legislator comes back and tries to bar these people, and 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 I've just watched as people said, okay, whatever it takes. What what is, what does it take right now? What is this fundraising movement looking to do? Well, we're going to literally pay off some of these fees and fines and free the vote for thousands more people. And we believe this is a moral imperative to include as many as people as possible in our democracy. We believe it's a moral imperative because the people of Florida, as you so eloquently said, voted 65 to 35. Since when does Florida vote anything 65-35? It's, it's been a divided state for such a long time, and the requirement for that amendment to pass was a supermajority, 60 percent, and we exceeded that supermajority by five points. So the idea that uh, uh, that uh, the state legislature would then turn around and try to basically repeal what the people voted for is, is so unconscionable for so many Floridians and so many Americans. So we're all coming together to say, well, let's erase these fees and fines by paying them off for people who need the help. And that's what we're doing. Desmond, um, you've had quite a week in the last week. You were named as one of the Time 100 most uh, influential people. Uh, you also were denied uh, your application for a full pardon from the governor, from Governor DeSantis. I think that denial happened today or yesterday. Your, your reaction to that denial? Yeah, and I look at it, uh, Chris, as justice delayed is is justice denied, and I was actually denied the decision. But that experience really speaks to why we launched an Amendment 4 campaign to begin with. When you... We have a situation here where it was purely arbitrary. Clemency hearings are designed to look at what a person does after they have committed their crime, how they have rehabilitated themselves, how have they become an asset to the community. And it's very laid out. My track record is very clear. Uh, the work that I do with the homeless, the work that I do with returning citizens, the work that I have done even in responding to COVID-19 in prisons and jails. And, and I've had all kinds of accommodations uh, from being named Floridian of the Year and Central Floridian of the Year, and even Time 100 most influential in the world. And if that is not enough to show rehabilitation and a commitment to giving back to the community, then what is? And it just speaks to the arbitrariness yeah. of this clemency process that we've been talking about for many years. And that was the purpose. Well, how could we let four politicians just rule arbitrarily to decide which American citizen get to vote and which don't? Amendment 4 created an alternative pathway so that American citizens who have done their time, who have paid their debt to society and just want to move on with their lives and choose whether or not they want to participate in democracy, have that opportunity to do so. And that is what we're fighting about, because at the end of the day, it's about people, real people from all walks of life, all political persuasions that just want to move on and feel like they're a part of this country. Um, John, I, I want to ask you, since I have you here, and obviously on this, uh, this sort of somber day when we got this announcement out of the state of Kentucky about charges for uh, one of the officers involved in the shooting and death of Breonna Taylor. I know you wrote uh, an op-ed on her birthday. You've been very vocal uh, in, in looking for some kind of accountability and justice for Breonna Taylor. And for people that are feeling frustrated or angry or disappointed or upset, I wonder what you want to say about your own reaction today to that announcement. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm grieving for Brianna and for her family. I'm grieving for so many other families that have had these interactions with the police, that have had these killings caused by the police, that have gone with no accountability. It continues to happen. The system is not broken. It's working exactly how it was designed. So we need to change the system. And part of the way we do that is through our election process. 
Part of the way we do that is by voting for different attorney generals, different district attorneys who will adjudicate and make decisions in a way that's more progressive and more in tune with what's happening in the community and protecting the lives of all the citizens of the community instead of being in, in, in a collusion with the police force and the police unions to protect them. We need to make sure we're voting so that we have a say in all those local and state officials that make these decisions that far too often side with police, believe the police's account without taking into account the value of the lives of the police's victims. All right, John Legend and Desmond Mead. Uh, gentlemen, both, thank you so much for making time tonight. I really appreciate it.